Uh, Infosys uh, Science Foundation annually honors people for their outstanding achievements across a variety of disciplines, including in the social sciences. And Professor Munshi received this uh, prize last year, 2016, uh, for his work basically looking at the role of community, ethnic groups, castes, and so on in the process of economic development. Um, before I introduce Professor Munshi, actually we were supposed to have a brief overview of the Infosys Science Foundation and its work um, by someone from Infosys, but they have not arrived thanks to traffic. So I'll just request them to play the video. We are touched by the marvels of science every moment of our lives. But rarely do we spare a thought for the men and women behind these discoveries and inventions. From the wheel to the World Wide Web, it is the contribution of scientists that has led human civilization in new directions. Every generation must produce good scientists to move forward. Societies must spread the culture of science. One of the problems faced by uh, not only India but many other countries is how to get the young people interested in a career in basic science. This is something that has to start at an early age. Higher education and research form the first infrastructure for any nation's enduring progress. The first step in putting up this wonderful infrastructure is creating encouragement and incentive for researchers to benchmark on the best global practices. Well, the most important thing about research is doing the research. But the motivation for the research comes from questions that are asked by others, and therefore from society, as well as the benefit of the research goes to others in the society. It also encourages people when research is recognized to pursue similarly innovative paths. In life there are many activities where you get very worldly returns. You, you get money if you do well. But there are also activities which shape the trajectory of a nation in the long run. And a prize like this can have a contribution which I think is larger than many other things which we think of as policy measures to promote development. It is important to reward, recognize and publicize the work done by scientists today in order to motivate the scientists of tomorrow. Awards by itself is not the most important thing. But the awards gives you the distinction that your colleagues appreciate what you have done. They are grateful for your contribution and they want to recognize that. It's exciting to identify a winner because I know this is an important task. The winners will then go and energize the next generation of scientists. The Infosys Prize, instituted by the Infosys Science Foundation, recognizes excellence in the basic and applied sciences, social sciences and the humanities. The annual awards in six categories are judged by leading scientists and academicians. The jury panels judge the nominees' work against the highest global benchmarks in their respective fields. Uh, one of the criteria for uh, picking the Infosys Prize laureates is impact. Uh, it is impact in terms of great research and then the impact of that research on society. What does the prize mean to the winners? I think it will help uh, uh, you know, provide some resources for me to encourage some activities that I, I think are worth encouraging in the area of economics. In the present research that I'm doing on hydrogen fuel cells, uh, when the media sort of came to me and I had to talk to them after the prize was announced, uh, I talked about fuel cells and, and a lot of companies actually who read it came to me saying they would be interested in collaborating with us uh, in developing this technology. The relevance of a recognition like this 
is incredibly important for a society that wishes its scientific progress to go forward. I see it as a way of communicating to society, communicating to students who will be the scientists of the future, that these things are important, these things are exciting. Uh, it gives the opportunity to scientists such as myself to engage with the community and to share what we do and to give them a taste of the excitement that comes out of their taxes. For the Infosys Science Foundation, the Infosys Prize is the first step in realizing the larger objective of spreading the culture of science. The next step has been initiated in the form of the Infosys Science Foundation Lectures. A journey has just begun. Let me just briefly introduce uh, Professor Munshi. As I've said before, he's the Frank Ramsey Professor of Economics at Cambridge University. Uh, his work is in the area of social networks, spatial and occupational mobility, and how that influences economic outcomes and the process of development. Um, he is also affiliated with a variety of other institutes in, as a research associate, research fellow. We've sent out the circular, so I won't take up much time. Um, pre previously, he's worked at Brown University, University of Pennsylvania, and uh, he received his PhD from MIT. So without further ado, I think we all recognize the significance of the topic, and I think he, no one better than him to talk about it. Okay, so l let me just jump str straight into it. Uh, so this is obviously a very, very important uh, topic, as you know. Um, it's something which is very emotional to many people. Uh, and what I want to do today is uh, perhaps to take a step back from that and try to think in a more clear-headed way about what about this problem, why at least one channel through which it might have emerged, and what we could do to try to address this problem. Um, I want to say this is not going to be the most exciting lecture, uh, but I think that sometimes you need to, you know, think more, you know, hard about the problems and, you know, try to understand exactly what the underlying fundamentals are. And that's what I want to try to do uh, today. So, as I said, sex selection is a very uh, serious problem in India. This problem was brought to public attention uh, more than 20 years ago, well, it's more than that, maybe 25 years ago, uh, when Amartya Sen famously claimed that over 100 million women were missing in Asia. Uh, and since that time, you know, India in particular has made tremendous uh, economic uh, progress. And we might expect that this progress would have been accompanied by uh, greater gender e equality. Uh, but at least on this one dimension, uh, it hasn't. If anything, the problem has uh, worsened over time. So just to sort of fix ideas, uh, what I have here is some data from uh, two census rounds, the, 2000, uh, the, the 2011 census and the 1991 census. And I've singled out um, the three worst states in the country. You're probably all aware of this. Uh, they're all North Indian states, uh, Punjab, Haryana, and Delhi. And uh, the, what, what these numbers actually are is the number of boys per 100 girls. So when the government of India and many um, you know, uh, agencies release uh, statistics on sex ratios, they typically will give you numbers in this way. It's the number of boys per 100 girls, and they typically will look at kids between the age of 0 and 6. Okay? And this is what you have over here. Now, one sort of question to ask is what is the natural sex ratio? Now, at birth, it's very, quite well known that this number ranges between 103 to 106 boys per 100 girls. So just naturally, you do have more boys than girls to begin with, but then you have convergence after that. Now, there's, so typical, you know, typically, people will, will give a number like 105 boys per 100 girls as a sort of natural sex ratio at birth. But then we know that there is convergence. So the question is, what is a natural sex ratio for the 0 to 6-year-olds? And we don't have an obvious number for that. And for this, what I would, what I would suggest is that let's think about no, the number that you have for South India, for example, um, prior to 1980. So I'm going to talk more about this um, momentarily. But it's generally believed that till the 1980s, you actually did not have sex selection in South India. And I'll explain to you why sex selection emerged in South India, etc., as I said, uh, further down. But if we look at the censuses from, let's say, 1961 or 1971, what you find is that the number of boys 
per 100 girls in the 0 to 6 age group in South Indian states is 102.5. So we don't need to care about the exact number, but let's use that as sort of the natural benchmark. Now, if that is the natural benchmark, then you can see right away that these numbers show that, ex that, that the sex ratios in these states are severely elevated. Things have been getting worse. Now, if you look at the numbers for, for all India, they're not quite as dramatic. They are clearly biased and they are getting worse. And even South India, which, as I said, was actually did not have any sex selection till the early 1980s, has now almost caught up with the all India average. Now, much of the, of the attention in the media, in research, has been focused on explaining changes over time or the worsening over time of the sex ratios. It's also been focused on particular states or particular castes where this problem is especially severe. Now, the first contribution of the research that I'm going to describe today, this is new research, is to actually document substantial variation in sex ratios on a new dimension, which is within castes or jatis, which are the fundamental building blocks of Indian society. And this is something which hasn't been noticed before, mainly because of data reasons. So we have, we have new data, which I'm going to tell you about, which allows us to look within castes in one district in South India, where in fact, on average, the sex ratios look just like the South Indian average. You have 108 boys to 100 girls. So there's nothing special about this district. There are no castes in this district which are known to have severe sex selection. And yet what we're going to see is within castes in this district, the variation in sex ratios is as large as it is across states in the country. And so that is going to be the first contribution, simply a document this variation which hasn't been seen before. This, of course, completely changes our understanding of the nature of the problem. This is not a problem that is confined to a few, to, to a few places or to a few subpopulations. It could very well, very well be across all castes in the country, in which case, of course, it's much more pervasive than people have previously imagined. The second contribution of this research is to ask why it is the case that you see this underlying variation. Now, the, now the, the, sort of the, the basic rule in Indian society is that you must marry within your caste. And recent genetic evidence tells us that we've been marrying this way for 2,000 to 4,000 years. I've been doing research for many years on caste networks. And through that research, I've done surveys throughout the country. And the number that keeps coming up is that over 95% of Indians marry within their caste. There have been recent nationally representative surveys like the Rural Economic Development Survey and the India Human Development Survey, which give the same number. So, the, so uh, within the caste, the, sort of the defining sort of characteristic of the caste is this sort of marriage rule. And what we focus on in explaining the variation in sex ratios within these castes is, again, the marriage institution. And what we're going to show is that, in fact, there are particular features of the marriage institution in, in India which give rise to the sex selection. Okay? So we're not the first people to link marriage to sex selection. In fact, it's generally believed that one of the, of course, there is this idea that there is sort of an intrinsic preference for sons, that parents want at least one boy to take care of them in old age. But in addition, in India in particular, there is a sense that one of the main causes of sex selection is the high dowries that parents must pay at the time of marriage. And, you know, here is, um, for example, um, God, how do I... Um, Oh. Okay, um, so here, for example, is, is you know, an, an advertisement which all of you will be familiar with this idea that you know, there is a connection between dowries and, and, and sex selection. This idea that parents will often go to an ultrasound clinic to find out the sex of their child. And why did they do that? Well, here's a perhaps even more infamous advertisement from, a se from an ultrasound clinic which literally said, pay 5,000 now, save 5 lakh later. So we all understand that there is this sort of connection between dowries and sex, and sex selection. There is also a common view that the wealthy are more likely to practice sex selection. But again, you have to, when you think about this more clearly, you have to realize that this doesn't make complete sense. When wealthy, when wealthy girls marry, they also marry into wealthier families where they end up consuming at a higher level. So if their parents internalize this, then it's not obvious that having a girl and paying a higher dowry makes them necessarily worse off than less wealthy parents. So one of the contributions, as I said, of our, of our research is to sort of think very clearly to clarify this link between wealth, marriage, and sex selection. 
And what I'm going to try to show you is that there are particular features of the marriage institution in India, which in turn give rise to imperfections in the marriage markets that operate independently within castes, which in turn give rise to sex selection independently of any preference for boys or girls. So in some sense, our model, our theory is a purely economic model. It's not a cultural model. It's not a sociological model. What we want to show you is that, in fact, it's the, it's, it, the incentives, because the structure of this institution, the incentives end up such that parents are better off having boys than girls, and therefore, they have sex selection. Okay? And before I actually go into the model and get into the details of that, let me give you some background on sex selection in South India. This is useful for two reasons. One, of course, is because our study area is in South India. So it will help you, it will give you some background, some context to what I'm going to show you. And the other is, in fact, is useful because, as I said, you did not have sex selection in South India till the early 1980s. So this transition to sex selection is useful in helping us understand the nature of the problem. So, as I said, the traditional marriage rule in India has been, this is all over the country, this has been in place, now it turns out, for thousands of years, that you must marry within your caste. And that rule is, is, is followed, you know, I think, pretty much universally. In South India, in addition, as many of you know, the additional rule was that you had to marry a close relative. So the most preferred match for a girl was her mother's younger brother, or if he was unavailable, one of, the one of her brother's uh, sons. The, the, rule, the marriage rule in India, this is again followed throughout the country, is that you have patrilocal marriage. Girls, when they marry, move from their natal home into their husband's home. So in this case, given this marriage rule in South India, what this meant was that the girl was essentially moving into either her maternal grandfather's home or a maternal uncle's home. These two families were really very, very closely connected socially. And in some sense, they operated like a cooperative unit trading girls from one generation to the next. So essentially what you had here, if, if you think about it in terms of, you know, it was like a repeated game with these two dynasties trading girls from one generation to the next. You essentially could maintain the sort of level of commitment. And so you, you, you really had no payments at the time of marriage. There was a ritual payment known as a stridan, which went to the girl, but that was really just symbolic. She was moving from one side into the other. The next generation, the girl moved in the opposite direction. And there was no essentially, uh, there was no cost to having a girl, and therefore there was no sex selection. Now, what sociologists like Srinivasan, uh, Srinivas, sorry, and, uh, the, and, and anthropologists like Caldwell have claimed is that what happened in the early 1980s is, was that with economic development, a marriage market emerged within these castes. And why did that marriage market emerge? The marriage market emerged because all of a sudden, dynasties which had been matched quite equally on wealth for many, many generations were no longer matched. So there is a social anthropologist, Karen Kapadia, who's written a very wonderful ethnography on a Tamil village around this time. And it's called Shiva and her sisters. And in that book, she sort of describes you know, the motivations and the incentives of, of different people in, the, in, this, in this village as this world was sort of changing. And she talks about, for example, a woman who had married in the traditional fashion, and her husband had become quite wealthy because he had a white collar job. And now the time came for her daughter to marry. And the question was, should her daughter marry her younger brother, the mother's younger brother, or should she marry someone else? And clearly the, the mother's younger brother was no longer at the same economic level. And what, 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 what Karin Kapadia says is that this boy understood that he was no longer in the same league any, anymore. And of course, what ended up happening is that the girl ended up marrying somebody else. Now, once you move away from this traditional pattern of marriage, you just somehow match these families, which were no longer closely related. And as a result, what ended up happening was that a marriage market emerged within the caste. And what the dowry did in some sense was to clear that market. Today, dowries in South India are as high as they are in North India. And with the emergence of the dowries also came sex selection. And so it's tempting to infer from the intertemporal correlation that in fact there is a causal relationship between the dowries and the sex selection. But what we're going to argue is that at the same time as the dowries, you also had this market emerging. And there are particular features of this market which actually are the root cause of the sex selection. 
Okay? There are five features of the marriage institution that are going to be relevant for our analysis, both for the theory as well as for the empirical work. The first I've already mentioned, which is that marriages are endogamous within the caste. The second is that marriages are arranged with family wealth being the major consideration. Of course, other characteristics like education and looks do matter, but it is generally believed that often the driving force, and we see this in our data as well, is the wealth of the families. The third feature of marriage is that marriages, marriages involve a dowry payment. This is true now even in South India. The fourth is that marriages are patrilocal. And the fifth is the social norm that all girls must marry. Now, there is a huge cost in India, a huge stigma if a girl remains single. Of course, for men too, they, you would, they would want to marry, but of course, it is not as, as much of a stigma. And in fact, what we, we hear stories today in North India, in, in, in states like Haryana, where because of the severe shortage of girls, boys are left unmarried or they've got to get girls from elsewhere, etc. For the girls, this is not a possibility. A girl must end up getting married. And, and what we're going to see is that, in fact, these last two features of the marriage institution are the proximate determinant of sex selection in our theory. Now, before I get to the model, let me just give you a little background on our study and give, show you some descriptive statistics which align up with these features of the marriage institution that I just described. Now, this project, this paper, is part of a larger study that we call the South India Community Health Study. Uh, it covers a population of 1.1 million people residing in rural Velour district in Tamil Nadu. So for those of you who are not from this area, Velour district is very much in the north. It's very close to Bangalore, actually. I just drove from just this morning from Velour to, to Bangalore. It doesn't take very long. It's sort of, you know, northern Tamil Nadu, right up against the border with Andhra. Uh, the study area itself is very representative in terms of characteristics like the age distribution, marriage patterns, uh, literacy rates, uh, labor force participation, both for men as well as for women, which is, it's very, looks very much like rural Tamil Nadu or rural South India, for example. Okay, so there's nothing special, as I said, about this particular place. And for our analysis today, we make use of two components of the study. The first is a census of all 300,000 households residing in this area that we conducted. And as I said, this is the first time that you could actually look within these castes to look at variation in sex ratios. And the reason why we can do that is because of the census. We have, we have 80,000 kids aged 0 to 6 in our data. And so we can look within these castes to see how the sex ratios vary with wealth, as you will see. The second piece of data that we use for the analysis is a, is a survey of 5,000 representative households in the study area. And the survey collected detailed information on many different things, on health, on social interactions, etc., also on marriage. And in this paper, we use the marriage module to look, to look at different features of marriages in the study area. So the first point to note is that most marriages, like I've seen elsewhere in the country, happen within the caste. So if you look at the household head and his wife, 97% married within their caste. If you look at their children who married in the last five years, it's 95%. Of these, of these marriages, in the parental generation, 48% were with close relatives, and now it's declined in the next generation to 35%. 80 to 90% of the marriages were arranged. If you look at the dowry payments, which include money, gold, utensils, etc., properly priced, what you find is that the dowries are somewhere between three to four times the household's annual income which is very much in line with other studies uh, that have looked at dowries, both in North India as well as in South India. Now, now, just to give you a sense of how large this amount is, if you lived in the US or in the UK and you went to a bank to get a loan, you would typically get a loan for about two and a half times your annual income. So these households in rural India, without access to formal finance, are basically paying dowries which are three to four times their annual income. Where do they get the money from? They get it from their own caste networks. So in some sense, there is a cycle, of, there is a circular sort of thing, where the caste networks give you the money to actually pay the dowry to marry within your own caste, which then supports these marriage institutions in turn, then support the network, etc. right? But that's another story. The point is that you have extremely high levels of dowry over here as well. Uh, notice also that the dowry that is reported to have been given by the girls is greater than the dowry that is reported to have been received by the boys. Now, this could be a reporting error because, of course, you always want to report that you gave a lot but you didn't receive very much. But what you're going to see is, in fact, that this is also predicted by our model. 
and you'll see this momentarily, okay? Okay, so now comes the part where you need to sort of put a focus a little bit because I'm going to take you through a very simple economic model which tries to clarify why it is the case that marriage institution in India has given rise to sex selection. Um, this is an economic model, so what we try to do here is to focus on those features which we think are critical to understanding this, this, this phenomenon. We abstract away from many important features of the marriage institution, many important features of the family, just so that we can focus on what really matters. So in, 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 in particular, each family consists of just two individuals, so there's no fertility here. There's a parent who has indeterminate sex. It's not a male or a female, they're just a parent. And then there's a child, a single child, who's either male or female. There's no production in this model. Each, each family is endowed with a certain amount of wealth, and that's it. And that wealth, when the, when the two families match, the total wealth is sort of pooled and then is sort of distributed. And the key to the sex selection is going to be how this wealth is going to be distributed among the different agents in the model. There are no individual characteristics here. So there's no education, there's nothing else going on over here. It's just the wealth of the two families and the way that they are matching. It's just a single generation. So they're going to take the wealth that they have and they're going to consume it and that's the end of the story. So there are no grandchildren here or anything else. But what this is going to do is to, it's going to allow us to focus, as I said, on those features of the marriage institution in India which we think are responsible for the sex selection. Okay? Now, as I, so, so in terms of what, what parents want, in terms of their preferences, we're going to assume that they are altruistic. They put as much weight on their own consumption as they put on their children's consumption. But they don't care explicitly or intrinsically about their child's sex. So they care equally about boys and girls. Sex selection is going to arise in our model not because parents care more for boys, but because as it will turn out, when you have a boy, you end up with higher utility than when you have a girl. Okay? Um, so the other thing about marriage, which I mentioned earlier, is that marriage is patrilocal. So when the girl marries in our model, she moves from her home into her husband's home. Now remember, her parent is altruistic. He would like to share his wealth with her. But he can't give her a bequest directly. So what does he do? He pays a dowry to her husband's parent. And that husband's parent is going to give a transfer to his son. And some of that transfer is going to end up going to the girl. So this bequest is going through this very convoluted channel to the daughter. And that is going to be one reason, as you will see, for why you have sex selection. So to understand the source of the problem, here's a picture which sort of, I think, clarifies where the, you know, where the inefficiencies, inefficiencies are going to actually arise in our model. So the way that I've drawn this is you, I, the, the parent is sort of, you know, there, there, there are two sexes here to sort of emphasize the idea that there is no particular gender to the parent, okay? There's a single parent in each family. And I've just given some numbers over here to make things, you know, to, 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 to sort of give you a sense of what, you know, what inefficiencies arise. So in this particular example, there are two parents who are both endowed with 100 units of wealth. So now the girl's parent has to decide how much dowry to give to the boy's side. And what I've done, now if the girl's parent could give the money directly to the girl, given that this person is, is altruistic, the parent would keep 50 and give 50 to the girl. But what you see over here is that, in fact, and I've just, these are just numbers that I've made up, okay? But nevertheless, I think they will give you a sense of what's going on. The parent is going to give only 45. Why does the parent only give 45? Because the parent knows that the boy's parent who gets the dowry is not going to give all the money to the girl. What the boy's parent is going to do now, because this parent has 145, is to decide how much to keep for himself and how much to give to his son as a transfer. And the way that I've set this up is he keeps... He keeps 65 for himself and he gives 80 as a transfer. And again, if the boy's parent could give the money directly to his son, he would keep half for himself and he would give half to his son. But he doesn't do that. He ends up consuming 65 and of the transfer amount of 80, the boy ends up with 45 and his wife ends up with 35. So you can start to see what is happening over here. The girl's parent gave a dowry of 45, but the girl ended up only consuming 35. So along the way, there was seepage. The girl's parent, sorry, the, the, the boy's parent ended up keeping some of that dowry amount. The boy himself got some of the dowry amount as well. And at the end, the girl ended up with just 35. So that's one source of seepage in our model. 
If you look now at the amount that the boy's parent gave, the boy's parent gave 80, but his son only got 45. So the girl ended up taking 35. So as far as the boy's parent is concerned, again, there was this seepage. And these are the distortions which we will argue are going to lead to sex selection. This, I think, is, of course, a very sort of stylized view of the world, but I think it captures very well, I think, the distortions which are going to give rise to the sex selection. Okay? So the way that we actually are going to solve the model is in three steps. This is the basic setup. What we talked about here were two families with equal wealth who just happened to match together. But the first question we had to ask ourselves is, in a particular marriage market, you have a distribution of wealth on the two sides. And the question is, who matches with whom? That's the first thing we got to solve for. Once you've done that, then the next thing to do is to show that in fact at every level of wealth, there is going to be some amount of sex selection. And the last thing to do is to look at how this sex selection is going to vary across the wealth distribution. So the model will be solved in three steps. Okay, so let's start off with the first step, which is the matching. As the first result is that in this model, you're going to get what is called positive assortative matching. What that means is that the wealthiest boys will match with the wealthiest girls, then the next level will match with each other, and so forth, and that's how the market will end up clearing. Now, that is a very natural way in which these kinds of matching models get solved, but the question here is why is this the case? Because there are no, there are no complementarities, there's no production. There's no ability here, there's no production of income, there are no children, there's nothing, we're just consuming, right? So why is it that the wealthy end up matching with the wealthy in our model? And the reason is because the girl's parents are altruistic. They want their daughters to marry the wealthiest possible son. Sorry, the wealthiest possible family because then the daughter will end up get the daughter's husband will end up getting a larger transfer and through that the daughter will end up consuming at a higher level. Wealthier parents are willing to pay a higher dowry to match with wealthier families so that their daughters will end up consuming at a higher level. And that is the source of the positive authoritative matching. Now, as I said, every girl's parent wants the girl to match with the wealthiest boy. So what you need is for that dowry to be increasing sufficiently steeply as a way of making sure that this matching is stable so that less wealthy girls don't end up matching with the wealthier boys. And so in our model, this, the, what, what people think of as sort of the dowry inflation, the idea that dowry is increasing very steeply with wealth, is coming out very naturally as a way of making sure that the matching is actually stable, that the market actually ends up clearing. So that's the first result. You're going to have this positive assortative matching. The next step is to say, well, okay, given this positive assortative matching, given the structure of our model, what you're going to end up with is some level of sex selection at every wealth level. And why is that the case? So this is a little bit more subtle, and I need to try to explain this to you without getting into the, the, technique, the technical aspects of the economics. So the first issue is, think about two families and I'm just going to make up the numbers. Imagine that the boy's side has wealth X and the girl's side has wealth Y. So in our model, if the two families end up with the total amount of wealth, which is X plus Y. And the question is, how is that wealth going to be divided up among the four agents in this particular model? And to answer that, you have to think about what are the outside options for the boy and as well as for the girl. Now for the boy, the outside option is to stay single. And since his father has wealth X and he's altruistic, what would he do? he would basically divide up his wealth between the two of them equally. So the boy would consume x divided by 2, and the father would consume x divided by 2, and that would be their total consumption, and they would get some utility from that consumption. What about the girl side? And this is where the, 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 the norm that all girls must marry comes in. There is no outside option for the girl. She cannot remain single. And so as a result, because she has no outside option, her power, her bargaining power within the marriage market is going to be weakened. And as a result, her family will end up getting less of the total amount, X plus Y, than the boy's family. And to see why that is the case, let's look at this a little bit more. So there's two basic assumptions in microeconomics. The first is that individuals are insatiable. The more you consume, the better off you are. And the second assumption is diminishing marginal utility. The last dollar that you consume gives you less value than the, lot, than the dollar that you consumed before that. So as a result, imagine now that you have a family with wealth X. So the be, if this father is altruistic and he wants to maximize the consumption utility of his own consumption and his son's consumption, what's he going to do? He will divide the wealth equally between the two of them. So the most efficient way to use this amount X is to divide it up equally. Now if you want to arrive at that same level of utility, 
but the two of them are not consuming at the same level, then you will need more than X to get at that, to that same level. And remember, that's the outside option for the boy and his father if the boy remains single. So if it turns out that given the structure of the marriage institution, that the boy and his father do not consume at the same level, then it must be that the two of them will end up consuming a total amount that is more than X. But we know that they will not consume at the same level because you go back to that example over here. If you go back to this example over here, you can see here that the boy's father would never give his son the same amount because some of that amount of, that he gives in the transfer is going to go to the daughter. And as a result, the boy's father will all the, always end up consuming more than his son. Even though he's completely altruistic, he puts as much weight on his own consumption as his, as his son's consumption. But if, he's going to, if they're going to consume at a different level, then what that means is the two of them will need more than X. But given that the total amount is X plus Y, it means that the girl's side is going to have less than Y. If the girl's parent instead had a boy, then by the same argument, that boy would have received more than Y. And therefore, you're better off with a son than with a daughter. So this is a very simple argument, and it shows you why parents, even though they don't care intrinsically for boys versus girls, will still be better off with a boy than with a girl because of the structure of the marriage institution in India. Now, this doesn't mean, of course, that every parent is going to go out and have a boy because there is a cost to sex selection. But as long as there are some families who have a sufficiently low cost of sex selection, you will still end up with some amount of sex selection at every wealth level. And then the last step in the model is to say, OK, now how does sex selection vary across the wealth distribution? And to answer that question, here's a very simple example. So what I've done now is to say, OK, the match market is going to clear from the top. We said there's positive assortative matching. And I'm going to set it up so that you have two boys and one girl at every wealth level. I've just made this up, OK? But the point, the key point is that you have the same sex ratio everywhere. So what happens now? One of the highest boys matches with the highest girl, but the second one must match down. When you go to the next to highest level, one boy matches one level down, and the other boy matches two levels down. When you go to the next level, one boy is matching two levels down, and the other boy is matching three levels down. So what you see is happening here. As you move down the wealth distribution, the wealth gap between boys and girls is increasing. What this means is that, of course, a girl's parent who is relatively poor is actually less disadvantaged now by having a girl than a girl's parent who is relatively wealthy. Because these girls, as you move down, are matching up more and more. So as a result, there is going to be some adjustment. This cannot be an equilibrium. You will have some adjustment so that as you move down, the sex ratios will in fact start to become more favorable for this reason. But they will not adjust to the point where this is reversed. So in equilibrium, you will have this hypergamy. And the hypergamy will be increasing as you move down the wealth distribution. But you will also simultaneously have a, a slightly improving sex ratio as you move down the wealth distribution because there's an accumulating surplus of boys who are left unmatched as you move down. Now, of course, in reality, this is a much more difficult model to solve than that because you need to think about the dowry. You need to realize that the sex selection, the wealth distribution are going to be jointly determined. So this turns out to be a very difficult model to solve analytically. And, and I'm going to spare you with those details. But what we can do analytically is to show that at the very top of the wealth distribution, where go boys and girls have equal wealth, and for the last boy to match, remember all boys will not be matched in our model, but for the last boy to match, you can show that for those, at those two points in the wealth distribution, sex selection is in fact increasing with wealth. For the rest of the distribution, what we have to do is to solve the model numerically. Okay? And this is what you get. So when you solve the model numerically, the first point is you can see the pattern of matching. At the very top of the, what we have here on the y-axis is the wealth, is, is 100 wealth classes for the females. And on the x-axis, you have 100 wealth classes for the males. At the very top of the wealth distribution, boys and girls have equal wealth. But then as you move down, remember the 45 degree line is this blue line here, right? So as you move down, what happens is you can see that girls are matching with boys who are wealthier than them. That's the gap over here between the 45 degree line and the red line. And as you move down, this, this gap keeps getting wider and wider as the hypergamy keeps getting increasing. So that is the first prediction of this model, is that you will have hypergamy. Girls will end up actually marrying with wealthier boys. And this gap is going to keep increasing as we move down. The numerical model will also show you that the sex ratio is getting worse as you move up the wealth distribution. The probability that a child is a girl declines monotonically. 
The dowry is increasing, but notice the dowry that is given is greater than the dowry that is received at each wealth level. Why is that? That's because of the hypergamy. Because the girls are matching up and the boys are matching down. Okay? And then the last thing is that if you allow for some seepage, if the girl gets a smaller and smaller fraction of that transfer from the boy's parent, then of course the girl's parent realizes that the dowry that she gives is basically going to be all siphoned off by the boy's side. And as that increases, the dowries will go down and the sex ratio will also worsen. And this is the second reason why you will have sex selection. Okay? So what I've done for you is to give you a very simple model which actually tells you why you might end up having sex selection in a world in which parents don't care intrinsically for the gender of their child. Now, there are other explanations, as I said, for why you might have sex selection. In particular, you could imagine that parents just have an intrinsic preference for boys over girls. That kind of model will also generate the patterns that we see over here. You will have more sex selection at the top of the belt distribution, and it will decline as you move down. However, a model where its sex selection is just sort of determined ex exogenously or intrinsically does not explain why you have positive dowries. So you think about a country like China. You have sex selection in China, and most people there would argue that the reason for that is because parents have a preference for boys over girls. No one there talks about the marriage market being the cause of the sex selection. And what you find in China, because girls are on the short side of the market, there's a shortage of girls, is in fact we have very high bride price. The money goes in the opposite direction. What is striking about India is that this is a place where, in fact, you have a shortage of girls, and yet the girls who are on the short side are giving money to the boy's side. That tells you that there must be something about the marriage institution itself which is causing the problem. And in fact, there is some recent research now which shows that there is, in fact, a causal relationship between marriage and sex selection in India. And then the final point is that, you know, often people will say, well, you know, what, what parents want is not that they care about boys per se. They just want one boy to take care of them. Now, if that is true, then there's an additional prediction, which is that the sex ratio will worsen as you move up to higher birth order. So imagine, for example, that parents want to have five children. When they have the first child, the child is a girl, they don't really care. When they have the second child, the child is a girl, they don't really care. But as they move towards number five, they start to worry more and more, and the sex ratio is going to start to worsen. And if they've had four girls, then that fifth kid is surely going to be a boy. And people have no documented this, for example, in India, that the sex ratio worsens as you move up the birth orders. The point is that in our model, there's a very strong prediction, which is that even for the first births, firstborn children should also have biased sex ratios which is not true in the alternative model, where the only motivation is to have at least one son. And here is data from our survey, or from our study, sorry, um, as well as from the DHS and from the IHDS. Now, just to be clear, this is not the sex ratio at birth. This is the sex ratio of children aged 0 to 6 who are first born. Okay? And what you find is that you have a number which is around 105 or 106. And as I told you, what the benchmark that we want to use here is 102.5. So this is not severely biased, and in fact is less than the overall sex ratio, both in our study as well as in these surveys, which is about 108 or 109, which is what it is for South India. But you can see that the firstborn children also are biased. So for all of these reasons, we have some evidence here that there is something going on here with the marriage institution, which is giving rise to the sex selection. So now let me give you some evidence from our study on which sort of essentially matches up to the predictions of our model. I'm going to give you evidence on the hypergamy or the matching. I'm going to give you evidence on the dowries. And then I'm going to give you evidence on the sex ratios. So in our survey, we asked the primary sort of respondent, the primary the household, uh, the, the primary earner, about the marriages of his children in the last five years. And one of the questions was, was the spouse's family of the same wealth more wealthier or less wealthy than your family? So this is a very crude question, right? But what you find is that when they respond for their sons, what they say is that 9% married into a wealthier family. When they respond for their daughters, they say that 18% married into a wealthier family. But for the sons, 29% are reported to have married into a poorer family versus 17% for the daughters. So this is showing you that on average, girls are marrying up and boys are marrying down. Now, of course, this is a very crude question. What we would really like to see is whether, in fact, this is something which you could get, you know, more objectively, and in particular, whether you could see how hypergamy varies across the wealth distribution. 
Now, the, 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 the challenge here for us is that we know the wealth of our survey households, but we don't know the wealth. It, that's hard enough, by the way, to get. Getting wealth data is not easy. But then getting the wealth of the spouse's family is a whole other story. How are you going to do that? And so the trick that we use over here is that I just coincidentally stumbled on data in the British Library a couple of years ago, which, which, where basically the British colonial government collected information in 1871 on all the villages in this northern Tamil Nadu region. And what they collected was basically the amount of revenue, tax revenue that they collected per acre of cultivated land. And it's actually remarkable because that variable interacted with caste fixed effects is a very strong predictor of household income today. Okay? And what that does is it allows us to, in some sense, predict the wealth of a household from a given caste residing in a given village anywhere in, our, in, our, in, in this region. And the advantage that we have here is that, that, is that when the girl marries, often they will marry within the same panchayat, right? But often they will actually marry for some other village as well. And so where, for those marriages where the girl comes from a different village, you actually have a prediction for her wealth in that village versus the wealth of her husband. And similarly, you know, on, on the two sides of the market. And what we're using is this predicted wealth based on the village that these people come from to look at hypergamy. And what you get over here is a very striking pattern. So what the model would predict, so by the way, here, what you, I, I'm, unfortunately, I flipped the axis. I'm, I'm sorry about that. But what you have now on the y-axis is the groom's rank in the caste wealth distribution. And on the x-axis, what you have is the bride's rank. And remember here, the, the grooms are supposed to be wealthier than the brides, right? That's hypergamy. And this gap should be increasing as you move down the wealth distribution. So the very bottom, the gap should be really wide. And then this line should basically be converging to the 45 degree line at the top. So you certainly have a gap over here, and by the way, this is statistically significant. And you can see the convergence, but this line is kind of rotated too much. So this is not perfect. It's in line with the model, but it's, it's this, the slope is just it's too flat. And why is the slope, slope too flat? The slope is too flat because we have measurement error in our wealth variable. And the reason why we have measurement error because is because what you really want is not the wealth of the household. What you want is the per capita wealth. You want to adjust for the size of the family. And in the dowry analysis that follows, and the sex selection analysis that follows, I will be able to do that. But for this particular analysis, I can't do that because I don't know the number of family members in the spouse's family. I don't have that information. And as a result, your, your estimates are biased towards zero. And that is why you get this flattening. But this is nevertheless really quite striking that you can pick up with the historical data, this pattern of hyper hypergamy, just based on the villages that these people are marrying into. The next thing to do is to just look now at the dowries themselves. And here I don't have a problem anymore because I actually do know the size of the family. This is now the reference household in my survey. And this is based on the marriages that occurred in the last five years. We can do this in different, rank the households in different ways within their caste. We can use just those households which married. We could use all households in the caste. It doesn't really matter. What you see is that the dowries are increasing very steeply with the household's rank in the wealth distribution. And notice that you have positive dowries everywhere. Okay, you're starting off at a very high, quite a, quite a high level. This is like 1.5 lakhs, and you're staying there all the way through. Okay, and it's almost doubling over the range of the wealth distribution. You can do this separately for boys and girls, and you can see that girls, they kind of track together, they're quite parallel, but girls are always above the boys. Okay, so this is the, these are the results on hypergamy and on dowry. And now let me get to the core result, which has to do with the sex selection. And here the challenge is to show that there's a causal relationship between the household's position in the caste wealth distribution and the sex of the child. There are many other explanations that have been put forward, for example, for changes over time in sex selection. For example, people have said that you have access to ultrasound. It's cheaper now to actually change the sex of your child. And these are changes over time, but you could also imagine that these same changes could, be, uh, could occur in the cross-section because, for example, wealthy households have better access to ultrasound technology than less wealthy households. But the key to the identification is the, is the, is the realization that in our, in our model, basically what are you doing here? You're looking at the household's position in the per capita wealth distribution. How are you computing that? You're using two variables to compute the household's per capita wealth. It's the wealth of the household and the family size. That's it. And so what you have to worry about is that these two variables could somehow be correlated with any other independent determinant of sex selection. 
It could be ultrasound, it could be you know, returns to boys versus girls, it could be whatever it is that is out there. But the key is that there's only two variables that could basically be correlated with these other independent determinants of sex selection. So this is an environment in which you can use what is called a control function approach very effectively. Because the control function will be just a function of two variables, the wealth of the household and the family size. And so what we do in practice is to put in a very flexible function. We put in the household's wealth, the wealth squared, the wealth cubed. We put in a full, you know, a full set of family size dummies and we interact all of that. And then we control for that and we look at then the relationship between the household's position, the wealth distribution and the gender of the child. When you do this, what you're effectively doing is you're comparing two households which have the same wealth and the same family size. But because they are in two different castes, there are different positions in the wealth distribution of their caste. And this is what you see, which is very clean and very... The, the blue line is basically the con unconditional estimate. This is basically, on the, on the y-axis, is the probability that a child is a boy or a girl. We're using here all the kids aged 0 to 6, but there are about 80,000 of them in our data. On the, on the x-axis, what you have is the household's position in its own castes per capita wealth distribution. And the blue line is just showing you that as you go up the wealth distribution, the probability that the child is a girl is going down. The red line is the one where you've controlled for, these, for the wealth and the family size. So you, have, you put in the control function. And now you can see, in fact, if anything, the, 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 the relationship is even better behaved. It's, it's decreasing monotonically. And if anything, it is actually steeper. You can control, you can look, for example, at, at you know, different ways of measuring the distribution, nothing really changes. And then perhaps the most stringent test is to just do this cast by cast. So there are 12 casts in our, in our data which account for over 80% of the population. And what we can do is we, can, we can't, of course, anymore control anymore, because for that you need to have all the casts lumped together. We can now just do this you know, unconditionally, cast by cast. And what you find is of the 12, you have the right, the right pattern for nine of them. There are three of them, the second from right and the bottom two over here, which actually goes in the opposite direction. And what I would argue is that this is because of small numbers. By this point in time, you have less than 2,000 kids aged 0 to 6 in these casts. And when you're looking at something like sex selection, you really need, need lots of data to get accurate non-parametric estimates. And so as a test of that, what we can do is instead of looking at the 0 to 6-year-olds, we could look at the 7 to 13-year-olds. Nothing should really be different for them. There could be some cohort effect, but otherwise you should be seeing the same pattern. These are just kids who happened to have been 0 to 6 seven years ago, and now you've just moved up in age. And you see, in fact, exactly the right signs, and now those three problematic casts are all perfectly behaved. So, so this is basically, the, as I said, the key sort of, you know, result of the paper, which is this new finding that within CAS, you see this very particular pattern. Now, how large are these effects? What are the magnitude of these effects? If you look at the amount of variation in sex ratios that we can explain, 70 to 85% of the variation is within caste. So most of the variation in our study area is actually within caste, not between caste. And if you look at the range of the sex ratios within these castes, it ranges from 97 at the bottom of the wealth distribution, which means you in fact you have a slight surplus of girls, to as much as 170. And if you think back to the table that I showed you at the very beginning, this is very much where we are with the worst states in the country. This is looking like Punjab or Haryana or Delhi. So within castes, in an area where the average sex ratio is just about 108, you're seeing as much variation in sex ratios as you see across all states in the country. And that is the key finding of this research. Now, the last thing I want to do in a, in a, in a, in a couple of minutes is to say, well, given you know, the model that we have, given the results that we have, what can we do to address the problem? Can we think in a clear-headed way about solutions to this particular problem through the lens of this, of this model? And we, we, we consider a couple of policies in, in, our, in our research paper, but let me focus on one of them because it's particularly interesting. And this is a conditional cash transfer program that a number of states in the country have implemented, where they try to get parents to have a girl and they give them a monetary incentive if they do. And the way that these programs are typically implemented is that if, when, when the parents register the, the girl's birth, and if they give her the, the, the usual immunizations, then they get a particular, a first transfer. If the girl completes primary school, then they get a second transfer. If she completes secondary school, they get a third transfer. And then typically at the age of 18 or 20, 
there's an insurance cover which matures and that money goes into a bank account which is in the girl's name. Now of course the question is, is that money really going to the girl? Is it going to her parents? Is it going to her in-laws? We're going to be, you know, agnostic on that. But this is the way that these programs are structured. And in addition, many programs have a stipulation that only households who are below some level of income are eligible for this. Now, given what I've just shown you, you can see right away that there's a problem here because the groups that are at risk are not the poor in this particular case. It's actually the, risk, the rich. And so the question is, what happens when you have this particular scheme? What are the consequences of this scheme? So what we do here is we estimate our model structurally. We already have solved it numerically, so this is easy to do. We basically find parameters of the model so that it, it matches the data as best as possible. And the solid blue line, sorry, this is the wrong one. The solid blue line is what the model would predict. What we have now in this, in this particular model is eight wealth classes, okay? And this is, I flip back now to the original thing where you have the number of boys per 100 girls. So the higher you are, the more biased is the sex ratio. And you can see here the sex ratio is getting worse as you move up the wealth distribution, obviously. That's what our model would also predict. That's what we see in the data, right? Okay, so the first thing we do is to basically give a cash transfer to parents in the bottom two wealth classes if they have a girl. And the direct effect of that, of course, is very effective. You can see here that the, 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 for the first and the second income class, you're way below the blue line. And that's what you would expect because they have an incentive to have a girl. But what happens to the other income classes? The red line is above the blue line. So what has happened here? If you look at it overall, if anything, the overall sex ratio has actually worsened as a result of this policy. And why is that the case? Because when you have more girls over here, these girls are going to basically push up the dowry. And the dowry is a price, it's a market price, and so it's going to affect the entire wealth distribution. And we saw earlier the dowry was actually increasing very steeply. So small changes at the bottom of the wealth distribution can propagate and shift up the entire dowry um, schedule in such a way that these parents over here are much more disadvantaged by having a girl than they were before. And as a result now, the sex ratios have actually worsened at the top of the wealth distribution. These are people who are not affected at all by this policy. But they have now going to have more sex selection at the top. And I want to emphasize this because when we think about this problem, we need to be clear-headed. We need to think about the fundamentals. We need to understand how exactly this is actually happening. What are the motivations for these parents? What is the effect of a policy? And you can see over here that a very well-intentioned policy actually could have overall negative consequences. If you give the money to all girls' parents, you would not have much of an effect at all. You would not make them worse off as we did earlier, but it's not a very big effect. The big effect comes if you could somehow target the girls themselves. If you could give a transfer directly to the girls when they are married, then their altruistic parents will actually at the time of conception, be willing to have girls because they know that going forward in time, they will not have to worry about their dowry getting siphoned off by the in-laws, etc. And therefore, they will have more, more girls. And so this is just a simple idea to show you how you can actually use the policy as a way and under, when you know the underlying sort of, you know, fundamentals as a way of actually improving particular outcomes. Now, of course, this is a situation where you're taking as given the, 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 the problem itself. If you want to directly address the root cause of the problem, then what you would really want to do is to try and put into place a policy, which I would argue would be to increase female labor force, labor force participation. Why is that the case? Female labor force participation in India today is dismally low. It's 40%. It hasn't really changed with economic development, even in Tamil Nadu, where in fact, if you look at higher secondary school enrollment, it's the same for girls and boys in our study area. There's something going on here which prevents girls from entering the labor force. And what I would argue is that if you increase female labor force participation, it would do two things. For the first thing is it would break the norm that all girls must marry. Because now, girls could be single, and they could be economically independent, and, you could, and then you would not have the stigma that, uh, that accompanies the fact that she must then move back into her natal home. In addition, if they did marry, they would have more bargaining power within their homes. That seepage, that, siph that siphoning off, which is causing the sex selection, would reduce as well. So if we want to really address the root cause of the problem, then this is the place where we might want to go. If we want to take as given the problem as it exists, then the policy to implement will be to try to somehow target transfers directly to girls and not give it through their parents, even if their parents are altruistic. Let me stop over here.
I do that because I, our entire study area is just rule. We don't have a <coughs> component. So I can't say anything about rule, about urban India. We do know, however, that even in urban India, urban studies in urban India, you still continue to have marriage within the class. So, that, so to the extent that that continues, there's no reason why we might not expect similar patterns to play out even in urban areas. But I, as I said, I cannot say anything about it from our data. It is completely true.
that is the key point that we're trying to do. And the only way to test that empirically is to get the data that we have. We can look within a cast and see this action, this pattern. Yeah. Um, I have a question and a comment. Um, so what I come from Antra, and uh, some of the wealthiest families actually don't give dowries directly to the uh, groom's family. They give it in the girl's name. So almost you never know when there is, they have access to the groom's family. So uh, I'm assuming that if that were the case, then the sex selection among the wealthy, actually it's more among the wealthy. So the sex selection would be less in those, is your prediction. Well, if, if, if we have data on those tasks, I don't believe that this is universally true in India, that wealthy families are able to do this. But if, 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 it is, if, if, if in those particular tasks, I would love to see whether in fact, because a very good test of this theory would be to see whether those particular tasks, you don't see this, this type of pattern. So but there's always a question that, you know, even if it's in her name, what does that really mean? So, for example, I, I was in field work, this is many years ago in Bernard, and I remember that, you know, so we were talking to these women, and they give, they have gold in a kind of marriage, right? And there's jewelry. So you would think, okay, this is something that the woman's whole thing, she's wearing it. But what they used to always say was that, in fact, when the man wanted to, you know, wanted more money, he would take that gold jewelry and he would pawn it. So, the question really always is, you know, when she, with picture of the marriage, when she moves into a new home and she spends the rest of her life in that new home, how much power does she really have? How much control does she really have? I don't know the answer. Uh, what you're suggesting is something quite, quite possible. I mean, that's quite positive because if, if it's in her name, perhaps then she really does have some power. Uh, but how these things actually play out, you know, within the marital home, Given that she has no recourse to any kind of, you know, really realistically, she, she cannot really, you know, go to her parents. She cannot divorce. Uh, it's not clear what it even means that is in her name, right? What does that even really mean? It's not like she can take the money and say, you know what, to help with you, I'm going to set up my own home with my money because of course she can't do that. So I'm not disagreeing with you. But I'm just saying that this is a very, I mean, to me, this is really. I mean, if you want to think about the problem, these are the kind of questions that we need to be asking ourselves. Where is the control? How can we somehow get resources directly to these girls? And I think what these wealthy parents are doing is exactly that. It's very much in line with our model in a sense, because this is exactly what you would expect parents to try to do. Uh, can I just say one more thing, actually, which just because I think it's relevant, is that another thing that parents could do, in principle, would be to actually, instead of giving the money as a dowry, they could give it to the girl, invest in the girl's education. In some sense, you can, this, this human capital is embodied in her. And so then she then has sort of, you know, the ability to go and earn money. We don't see this in our data at all. Right? We don't find, for example, that we, we see that wealthy, wealthy parents, I'm sorry, wealthy, uh, more educated parents have much more educated children in our data. But there's no effect of parental education on the sex of the children. So it doesn't look like this mechanism is at work. And why is that the case? I think the reason is, again, it gets back to the female labor force possibility. If the girls don't work, then just putting in investing in the human capital is not going to solve the problem. There is something going on here that is preventing them from moving to the labor force. And that would perhaps be more relevant than all these other strategies. I'm sorry, I have one more question. Sure. Uh, this is on the policy that uh, interventions that have been taken by some of these state governments, as I know. And in Madhya Pradesh, we do have this intervention uh, where uh, the girl child is given money at birth and at various so, stages, yeah. like you said. Right? Yeah. I'm a little surprised that that wouldn't have changed the sex uh, selection even in those communities or the lower uh, strata of the society where that really makes a difference. It should. In our model, for example, you see that it actually does, right? So what, what we see in our model, and you can see that, sorry, the picture's right there. So if you look at the red line, for, for the first and the second income class, the, the red line is far below the blue line. So they are, you have more girls there. But the point that we're making is those extra girls below, they're putting pressure on the dowry, and that's actually giving you less girls at the top of the value distribution. And given the structure of our model, which is actually you know, estimated to match the data, you end up overall with a worsening of the sex ratio. So I should also mention that you know, there are other policies that have been evaluated. So I'm aware of one policy where they actually linked the sex ratio to fertility. So the parents were given money if they had a, you know, less than a certain number of children, and if they had girls as well. And S. Anupriti, who is at Boston College, she has a paper actually, which evaluates this program. It was in Haryana, this particular program. And what she finds, for the reason that you were mentioning, is in fact, the sex ratio gets worse because once you reduce the fertility, 
then of course you want to, you, the, the pressure to have a boy increases. So these two forces are going in opposite direction. And in that particular program, the fertility effect dominates the sex ratio effect. And so you end up actually getting a worsening of the sex ratio. Uh, so I was wondering about the twelve classes and uh, whether one can think of differential inequality in terms of levels of income across these wealth classes. And in the way you sort of characterize them. So are you saying that if you look across class? No, uh, no. no, no, no. So if you're looking across the distribution of uh, wealth, yes, and you're bringing them into eight categories, yes. So the inequality within each of those categories is a bit different. Yes. Um, just to be clear, the, the earlier stuff that I showed, this is just for the for the you know the, the estimation. The earlier stuff, that the non-parametric stuff that I showed you. There, of course, I mean, I was not really binning at all, right? If you look at these pictures, these, yeah, yeah. there is no issue, yeah, right? Because I mean, this non-parametric is very, they're very narrow things. It's just for the purpose of the, when it comes to actually solving the model numerically, yeah. I have to, you know, obviously break it up. And just for the structural estimation, we broke it up into eight classes. Now, what we did there, I mean, this is in some sense not real data, in the sense that, of course it is real data, but we, what we did is we just basically the average of the household wealth within each of those classes and use that. So we're essentially ignoring the variation within those classes. That's the approximation. But that's just because you know it's just a simulation, right? So by the way, I don't want you to take these numbers literally, obviously, for that reason. It's just to give you a sense of you know the kind of things that can happen when you have these policies. I mean I also like I mean, okay, so I mean, does inequality have a story here? I mean over the same time frame that yeah. one is looking at, yeah. inequality seems to be growing significantly. Yeah. So one question, so, so this is a very good question, because in our, in our in the empirical analysis, we're totally living off this inequality, because the source of, of the identifying, uh, you know, uh, the assumption is that there's actually variation in the wealth distribution across the castes. If the wealth distribution was exactly the same in all the castes, then I could not do the strategy of actually taking two households with the same wealth and the same family size and find them in different positions in the wealth distribution. So I'm, I'm, I'm exploring that completely in the empirical analysis. But in the theory, what we could have done is to say, well, okay, what is the effect of you know, greater dispersion in the wealth distribution? And how does that affect sex selection? So to be honest with you, we, we are not able to make much headway. Part of the problem is that solving this model analytically is just super hard. And I kind of skirted around this problem, but the reason is because everything is circular. So in our model, for example, the wealth distribution itself is determined by the sex selection. So the wealth distribution determines the sex selection, then determines the wealth distribution, right? So it's all kind of, you know, simultaneous, simultaneously determined. And on top of that, we have this dowry, which is a price, which is being determined com competitively. So there's a fixed point. And this is now very technical for those of you who are not economists. So you know, it's a very hard model to solve. So then adding in the wealth distribution, you know, it's just not, you know, we're, no, we're not able to go anywhere with that. Um, so in a sense, what we're doing here is to back off from that theoretically, but then exploit the variation of wealth distribution empirically to actually give us this, this variation. Coming back to so, here, here on this. I'm sorry, I can't see. Oh, so coming back to Vivek's uh, point. Uh, so there is a Seema Jayachandran Roman economy model of uh, birth order paper. And that's one model, that's one way of thinking about the problem. This is another way of thinking about the problem. Do we have any sense of uh, to what what proportion of the missing girls would be explained by this as opposed to the Pardis uh, children model? In the sense that what is the magnitude that we are explaining through this mechanism as opposed to another? Right, right, right. that's a good, good, good question. And I can give you the answer here, at least in this study area. So if you look at we are trying to be about within caste variation, right? And not between. So this is not, you know, this is not about birth order and the other stuff. But within caste at least, 70 to 80 percent is uh, of the variation is, is within caste and the rest is between caste. This is not getting at the Pandit Chaitanya story because of birth order. This is just saying that we, because many people have this idea that really what matters is that there are a few castes which are really, really bad, right? Like you know, without getting into the names, you know, but like the Jats, for example. Like it's well known that they in North India are really, really, and this goes back by the earliest the 1871 census actually identifies particular castes, including the Jats, for having sex selection. And it continues, you know, you know, a long time later as well. 
In last time there are no costs like that, and so most of the ratio is within. Now how much of that is actually generated by our mechanism versus the other mechanism? Uh, I don't want to get into that, and I could use the structural estimates, for example, and say well, how much of the, how well does our model match the data, for example? We can't explain all of the variation, right? So if you look at this, for example, it's going, I mean, I'm looking for the first time here. So in the data, it goes from about 97 to 170. Our model is generating uh, variation from about 105 to about 112 or so. So that would be a way to think about the magnitude. I never thought of it that way, but I mean, now I'm starting my head. That would be. Yeah, yeah, but I can always control for that. Right? that would be, I, can, I can partial that out. Um, yes, I do actually. Yeah, I like to say, I mean, I could, I could, I could, in some sense. So it would be interesting to show which mechanism is uh, better in terms of the proportion. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's possible because I have to know. I mean, by the way, I should mention that in our data, you can see that the, it gets worse with higher growth orders. So their mechanism, the standard is, is out there. It definitely is, is relevant you know, in our data as well. So I just want to get back to what you were saying. So I know, I mean, I'm not trying to say that that is not there. It's there in our data too. But we are explaining some part of this variation. Uh, so the families that have selected the model are not necessarily, right? I mean, it, it is rural in the sense we don't have any large cities, but these are people who are living, you know, near towns or, you know, so, it, so no, there's certainly not all agriculture. There's going to be, you know, I mean, other, active, other occupations, other activities as well, certainly in this, in this area. It's just that no large urban areas included. These are all panchayats, to give you a sense of, you know, so there's no city walls, for example, in our data. Is, is that, if that makes sense to go if you work with these kind of data. Right? It's all about, it's just panchayas. So Remember, some panchayas are quite urban, right? I mean, that's the point. And at some point, then they become you know, an urban area, and then you know, once they go above a certain population, I, I can't remember what to cut off. There's a certain cut off, and then they become urban. So if it's urban, then it doesn't come into mind. So if you're looking at these families, uh, what do you think was stopping them uh, from, let's say, having the girl children enter the labor force? So this is, the, this is the, not the next paper, the one after for me. Uh, I don't really know the answer. I, if to, give, to be honest, my hunch is that there is, there is, some, there is some norm here. This is not, so, so this is I was talking to someone earlier today about. That to me, I think one of the things that is first order in terms of you know, research and development economics is trying to understand this sort of tension between uh, social norms and these underlying informal community-based institutions and the market. And they really do interact with each other, and sometimes they interact positively, and sometimes they interact in this sort of you know bad way. And these norms often have a certain use, or they, there's a reason why they put to place a long time ago, but then they will persist long after they cease to be uh, relevant. And so here is a situation in which I think, for whatever reason, it could be you know I, I don't want to I don't want to speculate because I haven't thought enough about it. But for whatever reason, there is some kind of social pressure I think which is preventing these women from actually going into the workforce. Because I don't believe it's a story where the opportunities are not available. Because this is something you're seeing even in urban India. These numbers are just too low to be explained by a lack of opportunity. So yeah, so I think, I mean, this is to me really first order. I think this is something which needs to be understood, uh, not just for its economic importance, because obviously you imagine now you have half, or nearly half of the population that is not entering the, the labor force. Imagine what would happen to you know growth and all these other things if all these productive women enter the labor force. But that's just you know the pure economics. But now what we see is this has consequences for very serious social problems as well. And I'm sure there are others that also it is starting to impact. So I think we need to think about this. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, how does your model compare to uh, what has transpired in Western societies? Uh, we see that before the 20th century, uh, labor force, um, female labor force participation was low even in Western societies. Uh, dowry was still prevalent there. Yeah. Uh, has has your model kind of uh, have you uh, kind of done that study where you have compared th yeah. the results from this model to what has transpired already in Western societies? Because you would have a lot more data. No, I haven't. Part of the reason is because this is not. This is. I just want to be clear. This is not a dynamic model. So I gave you that initial motivation about the, trans the transformation from the original close kin marriage to the marriage market 
in South India. But for us, the starting point of our analysis is the point where, in fact, that institutional transformation has already occurred. We're looking at a world in which the market already exists, where the dowry also exists. So we're not trying to actually model that, that transition. Now, I think what you're asking is, what's the next step? Now that you have the market and now that you have the dowries, are we going to then, you know, what is the next, you know, next? Uh, and again, I don't want to speculate on something that I haven't really thought about carefully enough. Um, it's not clear, actually, when I, when, as, we, as I'm answering you, it's not clear to me, in fact, how this equilibrium is, is going to break down. Uh, one way it would break down is if you could somehow jumpstart the female labor force participation. I think in that Western, the family economics literature, the way that this has been explained is through technological progress. So there's certain ways, you know, there's certain innovations, there's certain things which allow women to move from, you know, home production into the labor force, and that is the sort of, you know, explanation that has been give, put forward. Uh, in the Indian context, it's not clear, in fact, how, you know, what exactly it is going to be that is going to trigger this this transformation. Uh, but my view is that for these kinds of things where you have norms, etc., this is precisely where there is a role for policy. Because this is exactly where if, you're, if a, a well-designed policy can actually shift the equilibrium. Because when you have a norm, it's a world in which there are multiple equilibria, almost by construction. And you really, you, you really feel like this is what we are there for, right? I mean, this is what economists, I think, understand. And we really should be able to now start, and we don't do enough of that. We do not have policies which are really designed in a way that is sophisticated enough to actually think about it in this way. Where there are spillovers, where are these multiple equilibria, where you're really explicitly trying to move from one place to the other. But this is what we should be really thinking about. Uh, as I said, I haven't thought enough about it to give you a concrete answer. But this would be the direction to actually move in. And that would give you the kind of transition you're talking about.